I can do things like revise during the school year, but in terms of generating new... Yeah. I only yeah. Had, I was only able to do that once, and that's when I was writing one of the essays. Oh, uh, yeah. I was... You were almost 20 years younger. Yeah. And I was sort of on it. You were on it. I didn't sound like that. Well, Linda, talk about how you started yeah. Mary's Dust. Okay. Well, I wanted a project because after the, the book I'd written before, I, I discovered that I love having a project as opposed to writing poem by poem. And, but I, I did not know what that project was except that uh, I have a kind of life hero who is a, a, an explorer of the Victorian era, a woman named Mary Kingsley. Her father was a well-to-do kind of upper-class Brit who got the housemaid pregnant. So he married her, but then promptly, he had trained as a physician and he promptly got himself hired as the personal physician to wealthy people traveling around the world. And he would send these apparently wonderful, long, descriptive, terrific letters about all of these places that he was traveling to, but only rarely sent money. Mary's mother, just took to her bed. She became a lifelong invalid. So Mary is left in this sort of grim Victorian household with eventually a younger brother taking care of her invalid mother, never got formal schooling, although she read her way through her father's library. And then eventually her father, after multiple trips, coming home, leaving, coming home, leaving, he came home sick. And within three months of one another, both parents died. Now what? She's 30 years old. She has almost no friends. Uh, she has no other life. But she decides to, that she will go to Africa because she'd heard of it from her father, from his letters. She wanted to see Africa. But she also admitted later that really what she expected from what all of she, you know, it was called the white man's graveyard, that she would go to West Africa and it would kill her. But instead she went to West Africa and was... A. Smitten fell in love with Africa, and it didn't kill her. She persuaded the British Museum to hire her to collect insects, fish, whatever, in West Africa. And she, so she went back. Uh, she would hire a small number, three or four local guides, she carried all of her own belongings and a satchel over her shoulder. And she would just set out cross-country. And she would wear complete Victorian garb. She did, <laughs> you know, the corset and the whole, the stays, the whole, and the skirts to the floor, the whole thing. She never dressed in anything except totally proper Victorian women's garb. I mean, who does this as a Victorian <laughs> woman, yeah? And she wrote these wonderful books. Anyway, I, ad I adore this woman, and I really wanted to write about Mary Kingsley. So I was trying to figure, but I didn't want to write necessarily a whole book about Mary Kingsley. There are a number of wonderful books about Mary Kingsley, and her own voice is so wonderful in her own books that I didn't quite see a way in to write a book that was just a Mary Kingsley book. So at some point, I could not tell you when I conceived of the notion of, well, I'll just write about Mary's. I'll write a book of... What I find so haunting in there is the notion of the creative containing loss. Yeah. Could I mean, A, they're all dead. Exactly. Yeah. So it's inherent. Yeah, so it's it's elegiac. It um, is. Kind, kind of by necessity. And and you're also talking about loss of species and mm -hmm. here this thing contained in glass yeah. that is no more. It's one of the reasons I love the artist who's, who's mm. work is the, in the front of the book and also in some pieces within the book um, in the final edition is her, the exhibit I saw of Karen Lamott uh, at the Tacoma Glass Museum of these beautiful, mm. you know, dresses with no one in them. Yeah. Um, the exhibit is called Absence Adorned. 
Um, and that's it, right? Yeah, that's exactly. <laughs> right. It. All of these women are absent. Yeah. <laughs> They're all gone. They're all dead. Uh, and you know, the poem is meant to be the sort of you know the dress around the absence. That the women's lives that you're describing mm-hmm. lived very restrained lives, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so that you're constraining the poems is an, a kind of mimicking of yeah. their lives that were so contained. So you kind of have to capture that that you know the liveliness mm-hmm. and the passion and. Mm-hmm. Spark in that person, but it all has in to be in a corset. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> in a corset, exactly. Uh-huh. Yeah. Have the sort of Christian uh-huh. religious tradition. So often, Mary is the person you pray to to intercede. Yeah, she's yeah. sort of like yeah. the the your your ability as a human woman to uh-huh. ask God for something. And I thought, I wonder what all these Marys are trying to intercede. You know, yeah. they felt like these amazing sort of conduits. Um, yeah, and the burden of being a Mary. I mean, from the from the beginning, you know, of in terms of Western, yeah. co- you know, the yeah. Blessed Virgin Mary. I mean, hey, hey. <laughs> you want me to what? <laughs> Did you feel any obligation towards certain voices, underrepresented voices, or? I did, and I struggle with that. But I really didn't just want to write about white women, for sure, and I didn't just want to write about women who were like me in in any of those senses. But also, you know, there is the question, I think, you, uh, that I at least ask myself of, you know, what right do I have to write about Sage Coach Mary, who is a black former slave? Uh, and and write in her voice, that that's a first-person poem. And yet I felt really, one, I thought she was incredibly compelling as a person, uh, and I was very drawn to her. Annunciation. The air before her congealed and became the angel, blazing. Its robes streamed and whirled in a wind that filled her ears. Through its transparent form, she could see the brown hills and stunted trees beyond, magnified and trembling like flames. She could not have told you what was said. That story was conceived years later by men who had not been there. Afterwards, the stirred dust settled around her feet with a faint ringing as if it were the dust of a thousand bells.